Christian theology has been struggling with the question how a truly divine and a truly human person is conceivable. More specifically, the Christological controversy fought in the 6th and 7th century raised the problem, and for some it's a kind of weird problem, whether one person can have a both a divine and a human will. The doctrine of diothelitism, which was confirmed at the Third Council of Constantinople in 680, states that there are two natural wills in him and two natural operations undivided, inconvertible, inseparable, unmixed. Now Christological models that try to explicate this doctrine often refer to biblical stories, mostly to the scene when Christ, shortly before his capture and crucifixion, prayed on the Mount of Olives. In Gethsemane, facing his final temptation, Jesus freely submitted his human will under the will of the Father. Does this imply that he could have not submitted his human will and as a consequence run away and avoid the cross? What exactly is the relationship between the divine and human will in Christ? In this talk, and instead of discussing Christological models which argue for the compatibility or incompatibility of true humanity and impeccability, I want to, in alignment with the goal of this workshop, closely examine the underlying biblical narratives. It will be shown that the Gethsemane narrative provides us with theological insight beyond more, uh, mere propositional truths on the relationship between the divine and human will. Three variants of the Gethsemane um, uh, narrative can be found in the New Testament, in all three synoptic gospels. The evangelist John skips the whole passage. The core of the narrative is common to all three versions. After the Last Supper, Jesus went to the Garden Gethsemane to pray. He asked his disciples to pray with, them, with him in order to not fall into temptation, but they constantly fall asleep. Jesus asks his father to spare him from the painful death, but Jesus commits to obeying the father's will. Jesus is portrayed in a quite human way, especially in the version of Luke. In the following, the story is closely examined and some major difference between the three versions are highlighted. Gethsemane is a Hebrew term meaning Garden of Olives. Probably all three evangelists refer to the same area east of Jerusalem. It had major religious and historical significance. David fled there in order to flee from Absalom uh, to Samuel, it says, but David continued up to the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. The Mount of Olives is also assumed to be the place where God would redeem the dead when the Messiah comes. According to the Gospels, Jesus came to this place regularly. Thus, Jesus went out, as it says, as usual, according to Luke. It is remarkable that Mark and Matthew write that Jesus is deeply troubled. No reason is given here, but both evangelists let their Christ character predict his violent death in advance. In the narrative, Jesus is shown to be in deep sorrow, which is at odds with prior characterizations as a less human-like and, I could say, more godlike figure. In the following passage, uh, the, from a systematical perspective, most important sentences are uttered uh, by Christ. That is this here, Mark 14, Luke 22, Matthew 26. Yet not my will, but yours be done. He submits his own will under the will of the Father. It is clearly presumed that Christ had his own human will and that he does not want to suffer and die. The term cup refers to the words of Jesus at the, uh, at the Last Supper when he compared the wine in the cup with the, his blood which shall be shed for others. It is important to note that Christ directly addresses his Father. He acknowledges that he needs to overcome certain human desires to fulfill, fulfill God's will. Now Christ requests from his disciples that they not fall into temptation. And he mentions the problem of weakness of will. That is this passage. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. It is not clear here what exactly what kind of temptation he refers to. A feature particular to the version of Matthew 
is a threefold repetition of Jesus praying and scolding his disciples. This emphasizes the gravity and longitude of the preparation. So submitting the will is nothing that happens just in an instant. Submitting one's will to God is not done in an instant, but a process which includes moments of weakness and temptation in which everyone, even Christ, is dependent on help and support. It is not directly reported that the Gethsemane story counts as a temptation for Christ. Christ is only said to warn his disciples not to fall into temptation. But to what kind of temptations is Christ referring? It could be that he fears that they run away or that they abandon him when he is crucified, what we know eventually happened. It is, however, more plausible that Christ is afraid not only that his disciples succumb to the temptation, but that also he himself is vulnerable. Especially when he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He is not only referring to his disciples. He makes a general claim about human nature, namely that we all suffer from weakness of will. In his prayers, Christ may have asked God to give him the strength of will to overcome his temptation, which is the temptation not to take the cup, leading to running away or renouncing his former teachings and claims uh, which were counted as blasphemy by the high priests. And that gets clear, um, especially in the edition that can only be found in the Gospel according to Luke. One addition to the narrative can be found here. It seems that a sincere struggle is occurring in Christ's mind. According to Christian mythology, as reported, uh, for example, in the Corpus Aeropagiticum, but not officially recognized by the church, it was the archangel Camiel that strengthened Jesus. So that's the passage here. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Inter interestingly, this angel is often depicted uh, uh, by holding a cup, counting as the archangel of strength and courage. It is thus plausible to interpret Luke's version of the story as such. Christ was afraid of not having the courage to accept his painful and humiliating mission. He prayed and asked the disciples to pray to God for assistance within the temptation. God reacts and sends him an angel to strengthen him. Notably, even after this strengthening, Jesus remains sweating and in anguish. This conspicuity shall be examined now. Why is Christ suffering so intensely before his captivity? What exactly is his temptation about? Why is he, at least according to Luke, dependent on an angel strengthening him to withstand the temptations? Naturally, the decision for martyrdom is not an easy decision. There are many humans in history, in antiquity, notably Socrates and Seneca, but also many Christian martyrs who seem to be less distressed or not suffering at all before their violent death. Take, for example, the first Christian martyr, Stephanus, who while he was being stoned to death, prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, without any trouble. It remains puzzling why the decision for martyrdom and obeying the Father's will was as hard for Jesus as the story lets us believe. The widespread argument that the authors intended to depict Jesus in a very human way to counteract docketism is unsatisfactory since this task does not necessitate the given intensity of the suffering. To emphasize the psychological and physiological stress Jesus went through, Luke even reports that Jesus sweated blood a medical condition, uh, condition known as hematidrosis. I described, uh, quote, the condition known as hematidrosis was of special interest to Luke the physician. The strain of uh, the hour caused the capillaries of the skin to dilate to such an extent that they burst. When this occurs in the vicinity of the sweat glands, blood and sweat will be exuded together. The sweat becomes reddish in color, such was the agony and strain of Jesus in the garden. Is there any textual evidence for the reason for Christ's intense suffering? It is not even mentioned what kind of temptation Christ tried and managed to avoid. Was it simply the temptation to run away? Among others, Eleanor claims that there is a close connection between the wilderness temptation and later events that happened in Jesus' life. In the Gospel according to Luke, the narrative even ends with the words, 
when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an op op uh, opportune time. While some exegetes deny any historic core, so you might know Bultmann argues that the wilderness temptation narrative aims at showing how early Christians can avoid temptation and to distance the early Christian parishes from those who regarded Jesus as a magician. That's the Bultmann interpretation. Um, but others argue for a connection to later events in Jesus' life. So the exegetes Hermann Manke and Luigi Schiavo uh, interpret the narrative as a paranesis of those temptations that Jesus faced later in his public appearance. Oh, quote, the temptations might have occurred later than the point they occupy in the story and at different times, but could have been brought together and placed at the beginning of Jesus' ministry by the evangelists. Schiavo in particular argues that the wilderness temptation narrative rejects the awaiting of a political messiah and, quote, condemns Judaism's messianic expectations as diabolical. The wilderness temptation is thus mainly about Jesus' self-identity and trust in God. Assume, based on historical critical exegesis and on the doctrine of true humanity of Christ, that Jesus did not know from the beginning that he is God or the Messiah and that he did not know what exactly the mission of the Messiah would be. It could be, as John Milton has claimed, that at the times of the temptations, Christ knew that he was the Messiah, but, quote, did not know how he was to achieve this mission. That is, you're in, uh, in your book, Atonement, you're referring to John Milton. Let us take a closer look at the temptation narrative found in the beginning of Luke and Matthew. Okay, we got this here. Christ had to learn how he was to achieve his mission. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. When Satan said, if you are the son of God, it is plausible that he does not tempt Christ to reject the belief that he is the Son of God, but rather tempt him with an unfounded implication of his sonship. When mediating about the content, uh, when, sorry, when meditating about the content uh, of his mission and the will of the Father for his life, Jesus regularly considered the possibility that he must be given magical powers to help and save other people. At first glance, the first temptation is about using one's power for selfish reasons. But one could ask what is so bad about turning stones to bread to stop hunger and suffering. The narrative does not answer this, but different answers can be deduced from the context. As Stump argues, the temptation is mainly about the problem of theodicy. We are all tempted by the idea that if God loves us, he must alleviate suffering, and that he does not is evidence for that he does not love us. Christ withstood Satan's temptation by accepting that there are situations when suffering is the only way to achieve a greater goal, that is, the formation of a good character as defendants of a soul-making theodicy claim. Specifically, fasting can be counted as a kind of suffering with a purpose of willpower formation. Jesus is fasting in order to prepare himself for his mission, which is why the Spirit led him to the wilderness. He had to exercise his strength of will by fasting in order to withstand the final temptation in Gethsemane. Stopping this exercise would, uh, would eventually lead him to not being able to fulfill his mission, which is exactly what Satan wants to prevent. But what is his mission about? During his public appearance, Jesus was surely confronted with the widespread idea that the Messiah must free the people of Israel from political suppression as it is indicated in the second, or according to Matthew, third temptation. Satan says, if you worship me, or if you will bow down and worship me, um, all the, the authority and splendor will be yours. The narrative already integrates Jesus' evaluation of the options. Striving for political power to save humanity is an evil temptation to lead him away from his mission, similar to his later evaluation of Peter's suggestion to avoid the cross as coming from Satan. We have um, uh, unfortunately skipped that in your, uh, but you also mentioned this, this, this passage. In his novel, The Last Temptation of Christ, Nikos Katsantzakis formulates a possible version of Christ's original temptation before discarding it. Quote, I shall rise, gird myself with the ancestral sword, 
Am I not the son of David? Enough of ideas and clouds and kingdoms of heaven. Stones and soil and flesh, that is my kingdom. Since there was some biblical evidence, even for Jesus, that he might have a political, even military task to fulfill, Jesus might have seemed tempted to see himself as a different kind of Messiah. Had he succumbed to this temptation, and in, the, in Katsunsaki's novel he temporarily did, he could not have saved humanity. Records of vexing, statement, vexing statements such as, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, can be explained by this theory. The third temptation is the one that has the most obvious connection to the crucifixion. When hanging on the cross, Jesus was mocked, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Here again, Jesus could see this as a temptation to use his divine powers. This, however, would imply that he had secure knowledge about his sonship and that he actually had divine powers available to him. Neither is very plausible. As the third temptation shows, the case is about expecting God to help in a desperate situation. So the Luke version, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands. It is thus more likely that Jesus wonders whether his sonship implies that God eventually saves him from the death on the cross. The fact that he shouted to God, why have you forsaken me, a mere, rec a mere recitation of Psalm 21 is implausible, shows that even in his last moments he was still hoping for the cup to pass and expecting to be protected. According to the Muslim tradition, Jesus was rescued from the cross before dying because God would never leave a true prophet die such a shameful death. In Katsansaki's novel, the final temptation is exactly this scenario. In a satanic vision, Christ was saved from the cross, but eventually realizes that um, uh, by getting saved, he fails his mission. For some reason, the intense suffering on the cross was necessary for our salvation. But why? This must have been exactly the question Jesus was asking to himself in Gethsemane before finally submitting his will under the Father's will, although he obviously did not yet completely understand it. Looking back, the temptation is about doing something that does not lead to the salvation of humanity or omitting to do something that is necessary for this salvation. But why is Christ's suffering necessary for salvation? Why do we reject the view that on the cross God replaced Christ with an angel or some kind of zombie? There are many systematic attempts to distinguish between temptations to sin and temptations to omit a supererogatory good act. Uh, many scholars argue that Christ can be tempted to sin even if he is not able to sin, provided that he did not know that he is impeccable. Richard Swinburne even distinguishes between the three temptations of Christ. If Jesus was God, any temptation to do, do wrong must be of this kind that is without the possibility of yielding to the temptation. And the temptation to worship the devil is clearly in that category. The other temptations were temptations to do less than the best. If Jesus had turned the stones into bread or if he had not accepted crucifixion, no one would have been wronged. Hence, God incarnate could have yielded to a temptation not to do the best and that is why his doing the best in these situations, if he did, is the work of supererogation which made available an atoning sacrifice for our salvation. Contrarily, based on the analysis I've given before, I argue that not just one or two but all three temptations that Jesus faced, according to the biblical evidence, are not temptations to sin, at least not if we understand sin as immoral action. Even though the second temptation includes Satan's request to bow down and worship him, the temptation is not specifically about worshiping Satan. From a historical critical perspective, Satan's words are the evaluation of Jesus and or the evangelist that striving for power is not the ideal way to fulfill the way of the Father. Part of this evaluation might be that power usually corrupts in some way, 
here are quoting Stump again, the need for compromise inevitably in politics could reasonably enough be thought of as a kind of worshipping of Satan. However, that does not imply that all kinds of striving for power is evil. Had Jesus become a political leader, he might have been, if not killed on the way, even a very good leader, but not the savior of mankind. All three temptations, um, yeah, we got this here. All three temptations can be read as anticipations of events that happened in Jesus' life. He experienced the force of various powers, whether intentional or non-intentional ones, that were drawing him away from fulfilling his true missions. Sometimes, of course, such an evaluation can only be undertaken in retrospective. Similar to the Sermon of the Mount, the wilderness temptation is a narrative summary of different events or teachings occurring during a longer time period which includes a partial interpretation of these events. The so-called supererogatory solution to the problem of Christ's impeccability is challenged by those who do not define sin as immoral action, but rather as not doing God's will or harming one's relationship with God. Even if Christ is unable to, unable to act immorally, he could still be able to sin, that is, freely and culpably omit to submit his will under God's will. So it depends on how you define sin. Accordingly, Christ would be considered morally perfect, such as the Father is morally perfect, but not impeccable, if sin means not doing the Father's will. Now we have not yet explained why Christ suffers so intensely in Gethsemane. Especially if the decision is only a supererogatory one, it should not bother him so much. Moreover, the anticipation of severe pain is not as bad as the actual pain, and a fully virtuous character such as Jesus should not suffer more than necessary. Another inconsistency can be shown, or discrepancy can be shown by comparing the apostles' psychological states with the state of Jesus. Everyone was aware that they could be captured and killed. And not just in Gethsemane, but at least since Jesus started to undermine the Sadducees' authority. But the apostles seemed to be relatively calm, falling asleep. In her recently published book, Atonement, Eleanor follows Cardinal Newman in his explanation what made Jesus' psychological state in Gethsemane different, if, if not unique. The announcement of Satan in the Gospel according to Luke is directly linked with Gethsemane. <coughs> Satan tries, quote, one last time to persuade Christ to abandon the path of his own real suffering as a means of salvation for human beings. This persuasion is not verbal, at least there is no record of a direct or imagined conversation. Here again, the satan satanic origin of the temptation is best understood as a retrospective interpretation, but this time not even recorded in the Gospels. According to Newman's mental sufferings of our Lord and his passion, Satan gives Christ a foretaste of bearing human sin in order to let him break down or make him run away. This approach explains why Jesus is dependent on the help of an angel, which we just saw, to overcome this final temptation. It is a pain that is too much for an ordinary human going, uh, being to bear. It is based on the Paulan and Thomistic soteriology that Jesus literally bore human sin on the cross and not solely atoned for human sin. This makes the supererogatory choice to take up the cross a lot more drastic than the superficial reading, according to which Jesus had to choose to be a martyr for the sake of the authenticity of his teaching. That latter line, that is what I learned in my theological studies as kind of like the normal interpretation. Second. <clears throat> what does it mean that Christ bore or carried human sin? Analytic theology is often criticized for creating advanced and logical consistent models and also soteriological models, which are afterwards legitimized by quoting biblical passages and church fathers, sometimes take, uh, taken out of context. But certain biblical narratives can also serve a different purpose, as a hermeneutical key to understanding later dogmatic reflection. 
If we, as a starting hypothesis, use the temptations, suffering and decision-making process of Christ as such a hermeneutical key, and that includes that we actually empathize with Christ's situation in the narratives, we may have very different evaluation on the appropriate soteriological theory. So far, we have concluded that the situation in Gethsemane does not account for the intense suffering Jesus underwent. There are good reasons to, to interpret the story as a situation of strong temptation in which Christ is dependent on divine assistance to prevail. This temptation is not a temptation to do something immoral, but a temptation not to fulfill the Father's will, which included, at least as a means to a greater good, a painful death on the cross. There are certain biblical passages that can be referred to in order to explain why Christ suffered more than expected from a mere but fully virtuous human. In 1 Peter it says that Christ himself bore our sins. In the Gospel according to John it says that Christ takes away the sins of the world. However, the Greek term hairéo primarily means to lift, which also can be translated take up, grasp or understand. When comparing Christ to the suffering servant in Isaiah, biblical authors more likely assume that Christ suffered our sins and not just took them away, as Paul implies. In Isaiah 53, it says that, quote, he took up our pain and bore our suffering. In the original text, the Hebrew verbs uh, nasa and saval are used. Similar to the Greek translation, nasa can mean to lift up, to carry, to accept, to bear. The other verb similarly to carry or to bear a heavy load. It is clear that when the suffering servant is identified with Christ, he must suffer more than just the psychological pain before and the physical pain on the cross. He must suffer our sins, which is in a provocative way, um, sometimes, and I, I got that from, from like catechesis options, this picture, symbolized as such. And of course, we can discuss whether these, uh, these things uh, count as sins or not, but um, quoting here 2 Corinthians, Christ was made sin to us that he's actually bearing all that bad stuff. But how can a person carry the pain or suffering of someone else? Many theologians in church history have preferred soteriological theories which take the claim that Christ bore our sins as merely metaphorical. Christ took away our sins by either paying a ransom to Satan, by defeating Satan, by atoning for our sins, by showing us how to lead a good moral life in the light of mortality. The soteriological theories closest to a literal interpretation argue that in Christ, God is empathetic to all suffering creatures. God shows some kind of solidarity. Stump, if I understood her right, claims that God's empathy with human suffering is only possible by, mean, by means of the incarnation. If God is by nature eternal and impassable, not affected by any emotions, he cannot truly empathize with us in situations of suffering. If our eschatological state is best described as a union with God who shares all our mental states, we must admit that such a state seems to be impossible not only because of our imperfection, but also due to God's apparent nature. Even if we manage to develop a perfectly virtuous character, God could only share our final mental state, the one that we reached through forming our character, but not our memories, our past experience as victim and as sinner. By leading a human life with all its up and down sides, including the most intense psychological and physical suffering possible, uh, allows God to fully empathize with us. With this background, one can explain why Christ would have failed his mission by avoiding suffering and death. If by the hypostatic union the divine consciousness experiences everything the human consciousness experiences, uh, T.B. Morris speaks of an asymmetric accessing relation, Christ's suffering enables God to empathize with all kinds of human suffering. Uh, sorry. Um, Stump goes even further and claims that on the cross, Christ used his divine powers to mind read all mental states of sinners throughout history. 
quote, Christ opens himself up to the influx of all human psyches, so that on the cross Christ does God's part of the mutual indwelling for all human beings. By opening the human mind of Christ to the incursion of all human psyches, God allows all human beings to indwell in himself. Stump therefore evaluates that Christ's passion and death of Christ are in fact necessary for salvation for all people, although necessary, although not sufficient. It remains unclear, however, how one can conceive the inner Trinitarian relation regarding the suffering God. Is the Father eternally impassable and the Son passable, something, uh, sometimes the way Balthasar is, um, is um, interpreted? Or is the eschatological state of mutual indwelling only a communion with the Son but not the Father? Also weird. Uh, or is the Son by itself impassable and only passable in virtue of the assumed concrete human nature? Uh, that are solutions given by some, some Thomists uh, defending a compositional Christology. But that now goes in the analytical camp. Just there are certain questions, of course, arising from such a sociology, uh, sociology and such claims. But my original question was how to understand the Christian doctrine that Christ had both a human and a divine will. Doctrines of called diothelitism, telema, the will, dio two, the teaching, the doctrine of two wills in Christ. The analytic method encourages to first defining will and person and then constructing theoretical models which show how a single person can possess two wills. If will is simply equated with desire, as indicated by Maximus Confessor's writing, uh, that were those who re, uh, heavily influenced the dogmatic formulation in the seventh century, it is obvious that a person can have contradicting uh, wills, for example, a will to lose weight and a will to eat a very nutritious and uh, uh, yummy meal. If, however, a will is the origin of a free action, that is often defended in modernity, um, applies um, this concept of will onto Christology. Now, applying this concept of will onto Christology leads to probably a Nestorianist Christology, according to which Christ is a composite of two subjects of action, also a way that is uh, pretty problematic. In the Gethsemane narrative, Christ says in his prayer to the Father, yet not my will but yours be done. There are three common ways or paradigms to attribute the different wills mentioned here. One, Christ possesses a first order human will which aims to avoid pain and a second order divine human will which aims only, uh, to only follow first order wills which are in accordance with the Father's will. You can formulate that in different ways. It's applying this Frankfurtian um, theory of having first and higher order wills. I call that a psychological analysis. And that, that works if you equate will only with a desire or natural striving. Then a second way, also very popular, is a social Trinitarian kenotic analysis. So putting that, uh, interpreting in the light of inner Trinitarian relations. Christ, as the incarnation of the second Trinitarian person, wills to avoid pain, uh, but the Father wants him to endure this pain for the salvation of humanity. Christ decides to subordinate his will, the will of the second divine person, under the Father's will. Um, that, of course, implies a very heavy social Trinitarianism, and uh, a lot of people are not co comfortable with that. Um, it's like having two or three gods. And also it's a very strong kenotic approach that the Logos changes itself, um, laying off certain attributes even until laying off the attribute of impeccability, which normal kenoticists would never dare to do. And the third uh, paradigm is a so-called divided mind analysis. Christ is a composite of two overlapping ranges of consciousness. In the divine range of consciousness, he wills to take up the cross to save humanity. In the human range of consciousness, he wills to avoid pain. The Gethsemane narrative clearly shows that Christ struggled with the decision whether to take up the cross or run away. Common compatibilist interpretations which suggest that Christ simply did not know that he is impeccable and therefore is unable to, uh, to run away are unsatisfactory. Genuine temptation does not only require the ignorance of being unable to succumb to the temptation, but the actual power to succumb. Otherwise, Christ's struggle would have simply been a pedagogical theater. 
This, of course, leads to logical problems in Christology, which I and others have intensively discussed in various analytic papers. But for the purpose of this workshop, I'd like to draw attention to a variant of the divided mind view, so this number three, that could help us to under understanding diathelitism in the light of um, uh, the given soteriology. Andrew Loke introduced the so-called divine pre-conscious model, according to which there's only one consciousness in Christ, so he avoids Nestorianism, but a divine pre-conscious a range of information that compared to the subconscious could be accessed anytime, but is not. However, the pre-conscious postulated by Locke does not have an own will. It's just something like not suppressed information, but information not available at the moment for the consciousness. But since this pre-conscious does not have an own will, um, is why his view and also William Lane Gregg's view, which is somewhat similar, is often considered to be monothelite and thus not explaining how diathelitism is working. I think Gregg even publicly said that he uh, accepts monothelitism. It is important to note that as the psychological model suggests, when Christ says, but not my will, but yours be done, it is a conscious act of higher order willing but still an instance of human willing. So the decision to subject to the divine will is a human act of willing. Now the analysis of the narrative has brought to our attention that Christ does not know exactly what the Father wills from him until the end. He cannot formulate propositions on soteriology involving his near violent death and its exact meaning. But he trusts that what we could call his inner self, is sufficiently formed that it leads him to fulfill the divine will even if he does not understand it completely. Or even Christ has faith. As Goethe Brunschup told us yesterday, according to many contemporary psychological models, intuitive subconscious processes often guide our actions and these mechanisms cannot be fully captured or explained by the rational self. And here I think that Locke and Morris, Swinburne, all these that defend these divided or true consciousness views, get, get it wrong. Because they think of the sub or pre-conscious either as a second consciousness or as a realm containing propositional knowledge. It makes more sense to assume that this knowledge is not propositional but intuitive. And that it also incorporates a will, in Christ's case the divine will. He can, but he can only tentatively try to put this will in words. Um, yeah, so this incarnation is not accessible for Christ in a propositional way. That's important. And um, he can only tentatively try to put this will in words. He uses examples, narratives, and deeds. He referred to narratives from his culture in order to better understand his mission and his true inner self. As we saw in the various temptations, Christ is even faced with rational objections to his intuitions about his mission, even from his disciples and probably even from himself. Otherwise, he would never ask his father to let the cup go away. He is still intellectually hoping for an alternative, but he is for some reason resistant to these objections, even if many others are not. So, Christ is facing a temptation to not follow his inner self. If the divine will is somehow implemented in his inner self, following his inner self would mean subjecting to the divine will. We cannot be sure whether our inner self reflects the divine will. We even have good reasons that this is not the case. Our inner self is a product of genetic influences, cultural formation, biographical experiences, international adaption. There is um, as Paul notes, sin in us, which, um, as Paul says in his famous parish in the Epistle to the Romans, um, we experience as weakness of will and a proclivity to immoral action. I admit this last section is only an attempt to grasp the reality of the Incarnation. And the question whether Christ could have sinned or failed his inner self is also not answered yet here. 
Maybe this is for like ordinary analytic approaches to do. But I'm convinced that building the soteriological framework crucial to the understanding of Christian theology requires us to not only assume that there is such thing as propositional belief. And possibly, as theologians as Rahner have always claimed, the relationship between us and God is maybe not qualitatively, but only quantitatively, quantitatively different from the relationship between Christ and God. We also have our inner self, just that it is not yet completely aligned to God's will. So final words, there is no direct evidence for the thesis that Christ mind read all human sin on the cross. One can only refer to later interpretations such as Paul's soteriology, which can be interpreted this way. However, by closely examining the Gethsemane narrative and interlating it with the temptation narrative, one can infer from the peculiarity of Christ's extreme anger and suffering that Christ's salvific mission includes more than simply dying as a martyr. Possibly, it is sufficient to claim that Christ, because of losing the close relationship with God he once had, suffered enough quantitatively so that there is no greater human pain in history, so that he can empathize by analogy. That type of arguments can often be found uh, uh, with those who claim that Christ's temptation needs only be sufficiently similar to our temptations so that he can, letter to the Hebrews, empathize with our weaknesses. If, however, full communion with God is only possible if God shares all our mental states of every moment in our lives, including states of sinning, then a literal reading of Paul, God made him to be sin for us, seems to be without alternative. Thank you very much.